Thank you. Right, the next item of business is debate motion 17436, name of Ivan McKee on a trading nation. Can I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And can I call on Ivan McKee to speak to move the motion? Minister, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I'm saying officer, this government recognises the critical importance of internationalisation to our economic strategy to um, and drive uh, sustainable economic growth inclusive growth as uh, defined through our economic action plan. We understand the importance of exports uh, to the internationalisation strategy and we also understand that increasing exports drives further innovation in our economy, it drives up productivity and it drives up the tax revenues that we need as a uh, society to invest in our public services. It creates wider uh, internationalisation, the exchange of ideas and people um, and it cements Scotland's place in the world as a good global citizen promoting sustainable development. For all of those reasons, um, the export performance of Scotland's economy is of critical importance. Importance. And if we look back over the, uh, the recent period, over the last uh, 10 years, Scotland's uh, exports have grown an annualised rate of 4.7%. Um, and we recognise that performance. It's better than the UK's performance over that period at 4.3%, but we also recognise very substantially that Scotland can do better. And if you look back over the 20-year period, you recognise that Scotland's exports as a percentage of GDP, internationally recognised uh, measure, has been flat at around 20%. A trading nation, the plan that we published uh, on the 1st of May this year, um, addresses those issues. It looks at what Scotland as an economy can do to increase the proportion of our ex exports as a percentage of GDP. It drills down to understand what the hard choices we have to make. The uh, it's important to recognise that it's businesses that export, um, but government's role in that process is to help those businesses realise their full international potential. And the purpose, one of the main purposes of a trading nation our plan to grow Scotland's exports is to help us decide where to focus government support in that process. I'd like to say at the start of this debate that um, I'm looking forward to it. I hope it's consensual. I hope that members are inputting uh, uh, th their suggestions on what we can further do to grow Scotland's exports because it's important to recognise that a trading nation reflects where we are just now and it will continue to develop and grow and we will add more actions and direction to that as more information becomes available. I would also encourage, give me one second to finish, I would also encourage members to engage with businesses in their own constituencies to ensure that they are aware of what uh, a trading nation outlines, the online tools that are available there to help them, the support that's available from Scottish Enterprise, SDI and others, and my availability to come and visit businesses that are keen to export more to help them along that journey as best I can. I'll take the member's intervention. Brian Whittle. Uh, can I thank uh, the member for taking the intervention? I wonder if he would agree with me that as well as the need to grow uh, our export market, there's also a home public procurement market that currently we have a poor record of supporting like food and IT and construction and if we properly manage that it would be also crucial in helping to grow the Scottish economy. Minister. Uh, I think Brian Hill talking about procurement, public procurement. Right. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, that's an issue. It's not an issue for today's debate. Thank you for raising it. But of course, it's an issue that we, uh, we consider today's debates focused on what we do to grow Scotland's exports from our, uh, from our businesses. In terms of the, uh, the work that's, ha that's taken place in the export plan, it's been a hugely analytical piece of work. Um, it looked into a significant number of data sets over a period of time. It looked at international comparisons to understand what was happening elsewhere. Um, and as I say, many of those, uh, that information is now available on a sector and market basis online for businesses to take advantage of. It was also characterised by a significant amount of co-production um, engagement took place with more than 50 business and sectoral organisations uh, to inform the advice and the recommendations that, uh, that form part of the, of the plan. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank those business organisations that took part in that process and also to the team that worked hard over the last seven or eight months to put a trading nation together. Um, and the output of that is uh, a, a set of actions and a set of directions that helps us understand what government and our agencies and others need to do to boost Scotland's export performance um, to become best in class globally. 
As I mentioned, the Trading Nation looked at a number of strategic choices and didn't duck uh, the analysis on those and coming to some hard conclusions. And those con uh, choices really formed across the four different aspects. First of all, looking at the countries that we should export to, understanding the growth trajectory within those countries, looking at a total of 15 different indicators to analyse and understand not only what the markets of today look like, but also very importantly, what the emerging markets of tomorrow look like. And that led us to a strategy that focuses on a uh, top tier of 15 countries where we will significantly um, focus our, our activity and increase our presence, but also another list of 11 countries, the, the countries uh, of, for our tomorrow strategy, where we will have a presence and understand and monitor what is happening there um, as, uh, as, those, as those economies develop. Secondly, we look very much at, uh, at sectors to understand how we build on Scotland's great strengths, be that our food and drink sector, our energy and renewable sector, with the transition to low carbon, our fintech and financial services services sector, our uh, life sciences, our quantum mechanics, our space sector, many, many other sectors where Scotland has globally recognised world strength. Um, and the analysis looked at where of those sectors we were truly um, world class, what markets, what countries those sectors should focus on to understand how to realise uh, the best opportunities available and how Scotland compares against other nations, comparable size and economies to us in terms of where we do better than them and where we do not as well and there are opportunities for us to improve. Thirdly, a trading nation looked at uh, the profile of businesses within Scotland to understand uh, through a smart segmentation strategy how we should target our efforts on which sectors of uh, of our business community and identified that uh, largely the focus should be on uh, medium sized and smaller Scottish businesses that are exporting and have the capacity to do more and also Scottish businesses with that capacity that aren't yet exporting and the focus we will drive is on that those sectors of our, our business community to realize help them realize their their full potential and it's worth noting that within that community truly 74% of the businesses within those, uh, those tiers that we're targeting support to are SMEs and less than a half of them are internationally, internationally owned. And the fourth strategic choice we looked at was round about how to join the dots in market, how to make sure that Scotland's um, reputation, um, our uh, that work very wide diaspora um, and the other networks that we enjoy and the goodwill that's felt towards Scotland, how we can engage those uh, processes, organisations and others to help um, pull together a strategy in each market that helps Scottish businesses when they land in country, understand market, uh, the market situation, understand access to, uh, to customers and to uh, it make the most of that opportunities that exist for them. I'll take the member's intervention. Dean Lockhart. Thank you. Uh, the Minister talks about increasing exports. I just wonder what advice would the Minister give to uh, Scottish companies looking to uh, increase their exports? What advice would they give them about what uh, future currency to plan for, given his party's uh, uncertainty over what the future currency of Scotland might be? Before you answer, Minister, can I say I have time in hand for intervention, so don't fret. If you take interventions, so you will make time. up your time. Minister. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank the member for his, uh, for his answer. Um, in terms of individu individual businesses exporting, of course, they deal with the, the currencies that their customers or suppliers work with. And any business that exports significantly, as a member should know, could be dealing in four, five or six different currencies at any point in time, as I have done in my past business career. In terms of, I think, what the question he was trying to ask me was around about Scotland's position, uh, the Scottish Government's position in terms of our currency going forward. And he should well know, if he's uh, been paying attention, that Scotland's currency the day before independence and the day after independence will be the pound. Um, so moving on, um, the, uh, in terms of the, uh, the where we go with uh, joining up the dots in market, Scot Scotland enjoys significant assets there um, and we will be working very hard through a whole series of actions to make sure that, that our global Scott network, our trade envoys, the wider diaspora, our universities, our cities with our twinning arrangements are joined up to ensure that Scottish businesses benefit from those, uh, those assets in, uh, in country. More than 100 actions have been identified within a trading nation that uh, we will be working through over the coming months to deliver upon, and those actions build up through um, a, a series of mechanisms to deliver the overarching targets we have to grow Scotland's, uh, ambitious targets to grow Scotland's exports as a percentage of GDP. Um, those actions include the FM Export Challenge, which joins businesses on a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, relationship uh, to uh, drive mentor relationships, taking businesses that have 
significant export experience, marrying them up with businesses that are starting out on that journey to support them through that process. The International Trade Partnership, um, which we are working with the Scottish Chambers of Commerce, which allows businesses that are new to exporting to uh, take part in trade missions and the government working to support the chambers to facilitate those uh, to target markets as identified previously. Working to expand our global Scott network by, by a factor of more than three over the coming years and then further beyond that to ensure that we get the best from all the assets that we have. Scots working abroad with significant experience to engage them in a, a, a re-energised global Scott network and putting in place more trade envoys who have proved to be an invaluable resource in the countries that are currently present, supporting trade uh, by Scottish businesses that want to export internationally. Patrick Harvey. Uh, I'm grateful. The, the Minister set out those principles by saying that they're geared towards his target of increasing exports as a percentage of GDP. He knows very well that I'm very sceptical that there is such a thing as sustainable economic growth, but it is government rhetoric that that's what they're going for. So why is the target not based on sustainability rather than this narrow, myopic metric of GDP only? Minister? I think if Patrick Harvey had actually read the report or he'd listened to what I said in my opening statement, I talked about driving innovation, driving productivity, driving wider internationalisation, exchange of ideas and people, and cementing Scotland's place in the world, a good global citizen, and promoting sustainable development. All of those were mentioned in my opening remarks if the member had, uh, had been listening. Uh, we have put a hard measure in place because that's an internationally recognised measure. But as we develop... Uh, as as we develop the process, I'm quite happy if he's got a measure around about sustainable development. It's a hard measure that we can put in place alongside those. Quite happy to consider those. But if all he's got is a lot of words because he doesn't like the concept of GDP, then frankly, he needs to go and have a wee think about it because the reality is the targets that are in here are going to deliver an extra £500 million to, uh, this, uh, to the Scottish Government that we can, uh, in terms of tax take, hard tax take, that we can then use to invest in public services. It creates higher value jobs and more jobs within the Scottish economy. And if those are things that Patrick Harvey feels he wants to laugh about, then he's welcome to it. But we've got a serious job to do here to grow Scotland's economy through increasing, increasing our exports. And as I move on, finally, uh, presiding officer, to, uh, to finish on this, as I mentioned, the target to increase from 20 to 25 per cent, we believe is uh, achievable over the, the coming 10 year period. And as I mentioned, that will increase the tax revenue to the Scottish Government by half a billion pounds, money that we can then spend on public services within Scotland. To close, presiding officer, the key message here is Scotland's open for business. We a trading nation. We are outward-looking international, na international nation. We want to further increase our internationalisation despite the efforts of the UK government and Brexit. Um, and we have ambition to grow Scotland's economy through our exports and support Scotland's businesses on that journey. Thank you. Please, please move the motion, Minister. Please move your motion. I move the motion in my name. Thank you. I now call on Dean Lockhart to speak to move Amendment 174362.2. Mr Lockhart. Thanks very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, let me start by saying the Scottish Conservatives will support all proposals to increase Scottish exports because we're trailing behind the rest of the UK and competitor countries in terms of our performance. International exports represent only 20% of our GDP compared to 30% for the UK economy and higher for competitive countries. Our export performance in the past decade has also failed to meet all the targets set out by the Scottish Government by a scale of £22 billion. And if Scottish exports were to reach the levels of the rest of the UK, this would boost our economy by £6 billion, £16 billion a year. These figures show that after 12 years of SNP government, Scotland has not realised its potential to become a first tier trading nation. To realise this potential, we do need a new approach towards increasing exports. And there are many aspects of the trading nation strategy that have merit and which, if implemented properly, could have a positive impact on the economy. We also recognise the important uh, role and work the CBI has played in helping to formulate the Trading Nation strategy, in particular their recommendations to simplify the export landscape, focus on existing exporters with high potential to uh, grow their international trade and the commitment to increase digital resource. However, whatever merits the Trading Nation strategy might have, the fundamental flaw in the approach taken by the SNP to international trade is on the question of currency. At the same time, in fact, the very same week as announcing a new policy to increase Scotland's trade, 
the SNP also announced plans to introduce a new currency for Scotland. And Mr McKee, your answer that we will know the day after <laughs> independence. I will in a second, your conference passed a motion, the SNP conference passed a motion that they wanted to introduce a new currency as soon as practicable. So I, I, I ask the minister when he asks the question, how does this fundamental uncertainty of, of the future currency of trade for Scotland help business plan for the future? Minister. If uh, Dean Lockhart would, uh, 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 understood what the, was in the Growth Commission and what was passed at conference, it very clearly was based on the six uh, tests. And one of those tests, if you will be aware of, is ensuring that trade cycles are aligned and that allows us to move forward to a different currency solution. Because the whole point of the currency solution is that what suits us at this particular point in time. And if you read what the six tests say, they talk very clearly about trade cycles being in alignment. And as Scotland further internationalises in a position to do that and it makes sense, that is when the currency option would be considered. Dean Lockhart. Well, well, look, having the SNP decide when Scotland gets a new currency will not provide comfort to business, uh, Minister. And unlike some of your other colleagues, or what your other colleagues have said about the currency, is that they are currency agnostic. Uh, one of the SNP's leading MEPs said he didn't really care what the currency was in the future, that he was currency agnostic. Whatever that ridiculous phrase means, the fundamental point is business needs certainty. So will the questions are, will the new currency be, will the, I'll, 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 get, I'll give way in, in a minute. Will the new currency be the, the euro, which was the previous S&P position? No, you've changed your position on that. Will it be the pound? Perhaps, but we don't know how long for. But instead, the S&P has announced plans to create a new currency, a currency which is untested, the value of which is uncertain, and with an exchange rate unknown to our international trading partners. So let me ask the minister, how can business in Scotland plan to increase trading relationships across the world, plan to build a long-term global customer network, and plan their currency hedging arrangements? He said earlier, absolutely, businesses have to deal in different currencies. But if your home currency is a currency that you don't know what it's going to be, the value of which is uncertain, how can you enter into those hedging arrangements in the future? It's creating a level of uncertainty that is damaging Scotland's business domestically and internationally. I'm happy to give way to the Minister if he wants to uh, explain how this fundamental uncertainty over currency is helping business. If that, Minister. If, 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 frankly, if that's all they've got to say on this debate, it's a serious piece of work that tries to understand how we're going to grow Scotland's exports. And if that's all they can talk yeah. about, it shows how dis, uh, di disconnected they are from the reality of what businesses experience and the reality of what business organisations have told us. Because nobody's raised that currency issue. What they talk about is the practicalities of how they get orders, how they ship products, and how they, we, the Scottish agents, government agencies support them in market. And for somebody in the Conservative Party to stand up here and talk about uncertainty in the light of what their party is doing to Scotland at the moment is frankly ridiculous. Dean Lockhart. Interesting, the Minister says no one's talking about independence. Was he in the chamber yesterday for Mike Russell's uh, a speech introducing legislation for a referendum? I will, we have, no, we have many policies which I will come on to, but what we're seeing is the SNP again prioritising its political agenda over the economic interests of Scotland. Instead of creating this uncertainty, this should be the following key priorities for any Scottish government should be the following. Increasing trade with our single biggest market, the rest of the UK, which accounts for 60% of our trade. Scotland's trade with the rest of the UK has increased 71% since 2002, compared to an increase of 29% with the EU. But the trading nation strategy largely ignores the opportunities available for Scotland to increase our trade with our largest single market. No, I need to make progress. The Scottish Government has set up over 30 trade offices across the world in many countries which account for less than 1% of our trade. But how many trade offices do we have in the rest of the UK? We have one trade office, I will in a second, we have one trade office in the rest of the UK. Having one trade office in a, to service a market which accounts for over 60% of our trade makes no sense. That's why, and this is, this, is, this is our policy proposal, Minister, we have announced plans to set up a series of trade hubs in key regions across the rest of the UK to help Scottish businesses become embedded in the significant supply chains of the major economic regions of the UK. Not just have one trade hub in the rest of the UK, but have a, a, a series of trade hubs. Since 20, uh, 2002, our exports to non-EU markets have increased by 95% and now represent 23% of our trade, compared to 17% of our trade with the EU. 90% of the world's economic growth in the next 10 years will take place outside of Europe. 
It's therefore vital, I, I will make this point and give way, it's vital that we help Scottish business to gain more access to those fast growing markets. But there's really nothing in the Trading Nation strategy that explains how this will be done, just an aspiration to increase our trade. So Minister, we need to see specific actions to support business to access these growing markets. Last year, I was on a trade mission to Hong Kong, China and Japan. And what we're seeing in those countries, they're moving their global trade onto e-commerce and other technology platforms. Advances in technology mean the old models of export-import are being replaced and Scotland needs to keep pace with these developments. Evidence given by Nora Senior, the chair of the Strategic Board to the Economy Committee, highlighted that only 9% of Scottish business embed digital in their operations, compared to 43% in competitor countries. We need to do more to encourage Scottish business to embed digital in their operations. I will in a second after I, I announce another one of our policies. Another one of our policy proposals is to create an institute of technology and e-commerce, a specialised agency that will help business across Scotland take advantage of new global technology platforms, uh, create an e-commerce platform to expand their business across the world. I see none of that referred to in the Trading Nation strategy. In fact, when I asked uh, Kate Forbes whether the Scottish Government has a plan to introduce a specialised uh, e-commerce and technology institute, the answer was no, that it was dealt with by the existing agencies. Clearly that's not the case if only 9% of Scottish business embed digital in their operations. Again, perhaps the Minister can explain why digital use by Scottish business is so low under the SNP. We can't explain now, Chris you're closing uh, but you're winding up minister you can deal with that and you're winding up do you want to just do a last few words okay uh, Deputy President, officer, I, I thought I had a bit of time in hand I, I think they've the had an extra minute and I'm giving you another 30 seconds thanks thank you very much well look President officer I said before we'll uh, support any efforts to increase Scotland's uh, trade uh, we have announced uh, and we will announce over the months ahead concrete policy proposals which will help Scottish business to expand into key international markets we will uh, work with the government to support any increase in Scotland's international trade. But as I said at the start, we will resist any and all efforts to remove the pound as Scotland's currency of trade. And I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much, Mr Lockhart. Now call Rhoda Grant to speak to move amendment 17436.1. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, I welcome the publication of a trading nation and the additional investment that goes with it. It's a comprehensive document tracking where we are and the opportunities that we must try and seize. Um, that it is to be a working document with regular refresh will also help us track progress and allow changes to the strategy and also to build on the information that has been provided, although this is better than what has been provided in the past. I think there are still gaps that need to be filled. Our amendment notes that the Scottish Government missed their previous target to increase exports by 50 per cent between 2010 and 2017 with growth of 35 per cent over that period rather than the 50 per cent hoped for. However, exports as a percentage of GDP reduced over the same period, which is disappointing. While the rest of the UK remains our biggest market, this also reduced from 65 per cent to 60 per cent of our exports. And these are challenges we must meet in order to grow the economy and create jobs. And the jobs we create must be secure, well-paid jobs. Too much of our economy is based on low-paid, insecure work that leaves people one paycheck away from a food bank. And that's not something that is satisfactory, and indeed it is something we must all unite against. Our amendment speaks about small businesses. The report shows that by far the largest number of businesses in Scotland are those that have zero to 49 employees, but they are less likely to export than larger organisations. It's also well known that businesses of that size look to export, that look to export are much more likely to be bought over by larger organisations. And often these organisations are multinational companies and they're seldom based here in Scotland. The report does not highlight that most of our exporters are not Scottish owned, such as Scots whiskey, the Scots whiskey industry and the oil and gas industry. And foreign ownership means that we stand to lose on taxation. Yeah. Minister. I just want to clarify some, uh, some data points here before we go completely off, uh, off track. As I mentioned in my opening remarks, 74% uh, of the businesses that we will be supporting are um, uh, in, in terms of the high, the biggest businesses um, are, uh, are actually SMEs and that's where the, the, the vast majority of our support will go. 96% um, 
of export businesses are SMEs, and only 4% are large businesses. Uh, so there's some useful data points. And over 70% of export businesses uh, from Scotland are Scottish-owned. Okay, so it's important to bear that in mind. But our question to the member is, uh, does she think that foreign direct investment is always a bad idea? Ms Grant. No, of course foreign investment is not a bad idea, but we need to get the balance right and make sure that where we have expertise and knowledge in Scotland that we try and retain that here in Scotland. And I would have thought a nationalist would at least be willing to stand beside um, that proposal because we lose out to corporation. I want to make some process progress. Um, we lose out on corporation tax if it is a multinational because they choose where they pay their corporation tax and that is not often in the UK. We also lose intellectual property from those companies. How often have we seen something that has been designed and developed in Scotland and now being manufactured abroad, losing not only the revenue but the jobs as well? We also know that small businesses tend to be more resilient. They don't have shareholders to answer to and they don't cut and run when times get tough. Therefore, they're much more likely to weather economic storms. Therefore, the Scottish Government needs to support them and grow and uh, grow to grow and prepare for exporting. And that support must be direct in order to give them the confidence to export, the knowledge of the systems in place, but also help them to mitigate the risk. When on the cusp of ex exporting, many companies are concerned with the risk of expanding into unknown markets. And if at that time they're approached with an attractive buyout offer, the temptation is great to accept that. They need to see the rewards that can accrue um, are, that are, are greater than, the, risk, the, than the, the, the rewards of a quick sale. In addition, they need to be persuaded that the risks are manageable. And one example of this is the number of independent distilleries that are, we are now seeing opened up in Scotland. Most are producing gin for the home market while waiting for their whisky to mature. The government needs a strategy to help them export, but to retain their ownership in Scotland. What is also missing is an industrial strategy. What are we looking to export? There are targets for food and drink exports, but the strategy needs to sit um, on the export strategy needs to sit on stronger f foundations. What part of our industry? I'm going to make some progress. What part of our industry are we going to grow, and where the export? Where is the export potential? Therefore, an industrial strategy is essential for this export plan to work. Um, Brexit, of course. It builds on the uncertainty, uh, possibly delaying companies from pursuing foreign markets. As we approached the 29th of March, we heard of companies sending consignments abroad with no idea of the tariffs they might face when they arrived. And this was a worrying time for these companies, but seeing that also put many others off taking that step. This is not only the case for Brexit. Talk of India F2 also has the same impact. Given the UK is our biggest market, this puts Scottish business at risk. The Scottish Government talk endlessly about the problems of Brexit, but fail to acknowledge that Scott exit would be much greater in magnitude. Not only is our trade four times greater, but our institutions are deeply embedded throughout the UK. Having borders and tariffs would damage trade with our biggest market. Add to that the, trade, the trading in a different currency. This would be a disaster and would exceed the damage of Brexit by some magnitude. If the Scottish Government really want to build trade and with it the Scottish economy, they must end all talk of independent Indy Ref too. I understand the need to play to the gallery, but when that's damaging our country, they have to put our country before their party. And th therefore we will be supporting the Conservative Amendment. In closing, if I can just quickly turn to the Green Amendment, um, we are supportive of mus most of the sentiment that is in that amendment, and surely a government facing a climate emergency would take many of those points as read. But we do have concerns about how it is possible to have trade agreements that differ within the countries of the UK. Our current membership of the EU and associated trade agreements... No, I'm afraid you must conclude and move there, your own therefore, amendment. Therefore, we cannot support the Green Amendment, and I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. And I'll call Patrick Harvey to speak to move amendment 17436.34 minutes, please, Mr Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. 
I think at one level it's very important and welcome that we're having this debate because the, the one kind of growth that I'm always enthusiastic about is the growth in confidence of this parliament in continually trying to go beyond the narrow constraints uh, of devolved powers uh, and engage ourselves in, in the wider issues about our place in the world. Trade policy is reserved, but that does not mean that we shouldn't be debating it here uh, and debating not just how much trade we should be doing, but what kind of trade and what impact it has. The, the minister, I hope, recognises the long-standing green critique of narrow metrics like GDP growth. GDP, to put it simply, measures all of the good stuff that's happening in our economy and all of the bad stuff that's happening in our economy and just calls it stuff. And growth ideology says that we must always have more stuff. And programme for government after programme for government, um, medium-term financial strategy as we had today, budget after budget, strategy after strategy, all focus on this narrow metric. And the, the minister was uh, quite right and quite honest and revealing, I think, in his response to me. We focus on GDP because it's there, because it's a nice, simple, easy number to count. And as a result of decade after decade of its primacy, its undue primacy in economic debate, it is being used in ways that it was never designed to be used for in the, in the first place. And today, uh, I'm pleased to say that a, a, a group called Enough will be launching in Glasgow, uh, recognising that degrowth is an important and urgent debate that the world needs to be having. We're living at a time when we know we are killing the living world around us. We're creating uh, an existential crisis, uh, not just in climate change, but loss of biodiversity, uh, pollution, extraction of finite resources. And the growth, the everlasting growth uh, in our economy is not only causing these problems, it is itself unsustainable. So I regret that the government's trade policy is based on a, a, a target framed purely in terms uh, of percentage of GDP growth. The consequences of this, if we don't challenge it, will be manifest in things like the environmental uh, costs that we see from the growth of salmon farming. We, we want to export ever more salmon to ever more countries, and we know that the environmental and animal welfare costs of that are rising. I give way. Minister. Thanks for giving way. Um, I think it's important to recognise that the target is export as a percentage of GDP, so it's a measure of how international the economy is, um, and that's what's driving uh, export, uh, the, the export plan. But does the member have another um, proposal as to how we should measure it in numerical terms? Patrick Harvey. In, in four minutes, I don't have time to, to cover the you'll ways in which we You'll get your time made up. To... Mr Harvey, as I said, you'll get your time made up for taking Thank you. intervention. I don't have time to, to, to cover in detail the ways in which we need to move beyond narrow metrics. There are no simple narrow metrics that will be superior to the existing simple narrow metrics. This is the, 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 the set of ideas that we need to move beyond. The harms of this, this chasing after growth will be found uh, in the low wages in the hospitality sector, in tax avoidance by the successful, which will uh, unfairly compete with those uh, others who are looking uh, to become more successful. We can have an alternative approach, one that's rooted in trade justice principles. Trade justice principles such as those created by the Trade Justice Scotland Coalition, which have already been endorsed by this Parliament. Uh, a motion passed by 80 votes to 30, with only the Conservatives opposing the idea that trade justice should be at the heart of our approach. Presiding officer, in, in closing, one brief uh, sentence or two on the trade bill, which is also referenced in my amendment. We do need to challenge the notion uh, that those uh, right-wing free market ideologues in the UK government, those like Liam Fox and Les Truss, who would quite happily rip up the social and environmental protections which have been hard won over years and decades, they need to be challenged uh, in the, uh, the threat that their free trade deals would have, even to devolve policy like environmental uh, uh, protection and the protection of our public services. And the democratic scrutiny that is required in the trade bill is not there at present, and I hope that this parliament will reject that when the time comes. And please move your amendment. I'm moving the amendment in my Thank name. Thank you. And now Colin Willie Rennie. Mr Rennie. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. I'm trying to be in a good mood this afternoon. We're going to support the motion and all the amendments. Uh, I think the report, the Trading Nation report, is a detailed plan. It does draw on the expertise that has been 
developed in Scotland in terms of the overseas specialists, the trade advisors, the Global Scots, drawing on the experience of the Scottish Chamber of Commerce, making sure that we're targeting the right sectors, um, not just the ones who've already got the expertise within their businesses, but the ones that can make the biggest impact and the biggest contribution to our export capacity. In terms of the sleeping giants as well, we need to look at what the potential is to draw out the best from them. We also welcome the fact that there is a desire to improve measurement and monitoring uh, to make sure that we are making the biggest impact that we possibly can. And of course, the food and drink sector that is important to my constituency is something I particularly welcome from the report. Um, and I'd like to see further growth for that sector as they try to achieve their ambition of doubling the value um, of the sector by 2030. Uh, that, so that's why we will support uh, the government's uh, motion this afternoon. Um, however, there are two big shadows that hang over our potential to tackle uh, the increase in exports. Um, of course, there's Brexit, which despite what Dean Lockhart was saying earlier on, is a massive restriction and could have a massive impact on our trade. If you just look at the report in terms of our major exporting countries, most of them are in Europe, and we need to recognise that Brexit is going to damage potential relations with those countries. So that's one of the big shadows. The second big shadow, and this is where Dean Lockhart is right, is around about independence. And there is considerable uncertainty about the currency and when that would come in, how it would come in, what it would be. And therefore, how can companies plan for the future if they do not even know what kind of currency they will be exercising in? So there are two big shadows, and that's why we need to recognise that what we need is this country is to be an open internationalist country that breaks down barriers rather than build them up. But for that reason, we will be supporting Dean Lockhart's amendment this afternoon. And I thought Rhoda Grant did make a very good case for making sure that we do meet the targets that the government has set itself previously, and she helpfully highlighted that we have not managed to achieve that, but also a concern about how we keep businesses growing in this country and owned locally. We want to make sure we do get foreign direct investment because that can be healthy, it can improve the efficiency and effectiveness of businesses, but we also want to make sure that we can anchor the businesses here in this country. In fact, the best anchor for businesses in this country is the quality of the workforce that we have here. That's why good businesses come to this country to continue to grow. Um, and we are going to support the uh, Patrick Harvey's amendment as well. I am regularly briefed by the Trade Justice Group in St Andrews. They keep me well informed. They are most uh, polite and persistent group um, of uh, campaigners. Um, they highlight tax avoidance, labour exploitation, environmental standards, democratic scrutiny. In fact, we worked with Jeremy Purvis on making amendments in the House of Lords to the Trade Bill. Uh, but we also recognise that there, is, there does need to be a considerable effort to make sure that people are not left behind, that there is not labour exploitation, that everyone gets the benefit of improving exports and global trade as well. For, so for that reason, we will be supporting Patrick Harvey's amendment as well. Thank you. Thank you. We move on to the open debate. Emma Harper, followed by Maureen Watt. Ms Harper. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak in this important debate this afternoon, and I support the motion presented by the Scottish Government and welcome this significant investment of £20 million in the Trade and Nation strategy. From the outset of my contribution, I want to put on record again that Scotland has the most fantastic goods, particularly food and drink, produced by our hard-working farmers, producers and small and medium enterprises. Indeed, they're world-class goods and produce, and I say world-class because it is important that we be bold and proud of what our country can achieve. Their world-class products are sought after around the globe and are known for the provenance, the quality in terms of our food and drink and the delicious taste. <laughs> food and drink is worth over £2.5 million per day to Scotland's economy. That's £912.5 nine, nine million each year. Imagine what we could do with that money if it stayed here in Scotland. 
And of course, as well as food and drink, we also have an equally important engineering and manufacturing sector. And I'm pleased that Dumfries and Galloway have recently seen the creation of the Dumfries and Galloway Manufacturing and Engineering Network, which brings together local businesses such as Jas P. Wilson, DuPont, BSW Timber and others to share best practice, best experience and best knowledge. And they support trade and access to the wider EU and international markets. And I hope the Minister will accept the invite that I have sent him to come and meet members of the network to see what support the Scottish Government may be able to offer. Presiding officer, our goods in Scotland are, however, under threat by the national uncertainty over Brexit. Members will know from previous contributions that I have made in Chamber that I have been carrying out a great deal of work on protected geographical indicators, PGIs. PGIs are awarded by the EU to goods in Scotland to ensure they are not open to cheap and inferior imitation from other countries and businesses around the world. These indicators will protect our Scotch whisky, which is worth almost £5 billion to the UK's economy each year. And of course, there's our Scotch beef, Scotch lamb, Arbro Smokies, Ayrshire Dunlop cheese, and even Ayrshire tatties in my South Scotland region. These may be nego negotiated away by UK government in pursuit of cheap trade deals with America. And not only these products might suffer from trade deals, but our farmers and producers and small and medium sized enterprises could end up with lower quality food being brought into Scotland as well as the rest of the UK. Food with low animal welfare standards, poor provenance, and some such as chlorinated chicken may present health risks. I'm sure members will agree that we do not want to include chlorinated chicken or hormone injected beef in our trade deals. Scotch whisky from Tennessee might be seen on our supermarket shelves, and I would absolutely oppose ch changing any of our PGI status for our fantastic produce. I ask the Scottish Government to continue to do all it can to prevent such an occurrence. Presiding officer, in the face of the current EU exit uncertainty, I'm pleased that the Scottish Government's A Trading Nation publication gives a clear signal of our ambition in Scotland to remain an open, progressive nation where our businesses trade in global markets. Dean Lockhart mentioned the lack of info about digital support. It's there on page 70 in A Trade Nation, section 6.4. It's actually titled Digital Support. So it says, working with partners to seize the opportunities via trading digitally. Uh, she's just closing. <laughs> Even though you've promoted her. <laughs> I, uh, I am actually about to close, um, but uh, I'll be happy to send him over page 70 if he thinks that might help. Achieving this ambition to see international exports almost double from their current value of £32 billion by 2029 is what we are seeking. So I would like to finally ask the Scottish Government and perhaps the Tories to lobby the UK Government to prevent our goods, particularly our food and drink, from being traded away in the current Brexit chaos. Thank you. Maureen Watt, followed by Gordon Linters. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I too am pleased to be taking part in this debate and congratulate the Minister for his work in the area of Scotland as a trading nation and the new Export Action Plan, which is important at any time, but even more important at this time of such domestic UK uncertainty, uncertainty and global trade disruption, not least from Brexit and the US uh, President. Apparently, this is now termed slobalisation. It's uh, encouraging that the Fraser of Allender Institute welcomes the level of analysis that has gone into the decisions taken by the minister in this plan and says that, I quote, everyone should welcome the new, ev the new analysis and evidence provided. It says it marked a significant step forward in our understanding of the challenges and opportunities that Scotland faces in its efforts to boost international trade. It's true that Scotland's exports are less than many other comparable countries and that our export base is concentrated in a small number of sectors and firms. Now, this is not unusual for small countries to have their exports in a small number of firms and sectors or markets, but it does seem that we have a particular challenge on that here in Scotland. So with the relatively limited resources and business support through our enterprise agencies, it is important that the focus in the trading nations focuses 
on what are the export strengths the Scottish Government should, should promote, where should we promote these strengths, and when should we step up our presence in these markets, who should we work with most intensively to boost our export performance, and how do we best configure government and wider support to deliver our export goals. It is interesting that uh, the work has profiled the 26 countries which account for 80% of our current exports and the export value gap and where the bulk of future growth may come from. These countries include US, China, Germany, France, Italy, Canada, Spain, Netherlands, Switzerland, Sweden, Poland, Belgium, Ireland, Norway and Denmark. Now, it will not have escaped everybody in the chamber that that is 10 out of the 15 countries I mentioned are in the EU and it's wrong to say that there is not still substantial growth that can be had in EU countries. So it's absolute folly that the UK government is preparing to upset these trading links through pursuing Brexit and even countenancing, countenancing a hard Brexit. Food and drink is one of the two, one of the key sectors of export to our European neighbours not least the fresh fish products from the processors in my Aberdeen South and North Kincardine constituency. Not only are these markets in jeopardy, but even if they continue, the DEFRA minister refuses to guarantee priority access for these perishables on ferries crossing the channel. Similarly, the said UK government minister for environment, food and the rural economy is resigned to seeing the lamb export and thus our sheep sector go to the wall as a victim of Brexit. And I cannot for the life of me work out how he squares this with his declared concern for climate change if we have to import lamb from New Zealand in polluting ships and aircraft. Presiding officer, while food, food and drink is undoubtedly a Scottish success story and there is still much growth to be had in that sector, I would like in my final few sentences to mention the worldwide growth that is still to be had in the energy sector, including renewables. And I'd like to highlight Aberdeen-based global, global pipe components who specialise in manufacturing and supplying pipes and valves to the oil and gas and petrochemical industries. Currently, over 80% of their products go overseas um, and they praise the Global Scott Network for helping them identify markets. And I hope the Minister already has Offshore Europe 2019 firmly fixed in his diary. Gordon Lindhurst, followed by John McAlpine. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I'm pleased to be able to speak in this debate as the Scottish Conservative spokesman on trade and investment uh, to speak here uh, about what we're talking about, about how, about how Scotland can seize on the opportunities that await us in future trading relationships. So may I say, first of all, that the trading plan announced earlier this month in Edinburgh by the First Minister was a welcome step in the right direction with plans for 17,500 extra jobs as a result of boosting exports. However, it, it does come against the background of failure over recent years from the SNP. The First Minister launched or talked at that launch of boosting Scotland's exports so they account for a quarter of Scotland's GDP in the next decade. And my colleague Dean Lockhart spoke about this issue because um, at a UK level, they already account for 30% of GDP by contrast to the, the Scottish situation. So this is a plan which has been long overdue from the Scottish Government. Not only do they need to boost exports as a percentage of GDP, but there has been a massive failure to increase the value of our exports. The 2011 economic strategy, I think already referred to, outlined plans to increase the value of Scotland's exports by 50% between 2010 and 2017. But uh, the Scottish Government has missed that target by billions. Um, certainly. Iron Key. I take an intervention and thanks for your, your comments on, on the plan, that's, uh, that's appreciated. Just in terms of the data points, you're absolutely right and we fully recognise that that target is missed and there's more work to be done. But it's also important to recognise, as I mentioned in my opening uh, remarks, that uh, Scotland's exports grew at 4.7% per year over the last 10 years compared to 4.3% for the UK as a whole. So we are going faster than the UK average. 
Gordon Linters. Well, I, I certainly welcome any positive growth such as the, the Minister refers to, but I think one has to look at the overall picture and recognise where we're, we're missing the mark, as it were, and missing the step. And, uh, and a recent uh, announcement, of course, from the SNP government was this dramatic U-turn about the plans to cut air departure tax. Yep. And I'm acutely aware of that as a representative of the capital and Lothian region and also of Edinburgh Airport's response to the government's position on that. And they rightly question this reactionary, perhaps populist move, one might describe it, to scrap the plans, um, considering that they had made a promise that had just been repeated. And I did question the minister on this last week, uh, highlighting page 73 in the Trading Nation Plan which stresses the importance of connecting Scotland to international markets through long-haul flights, including via Edinburgh Airport. And uh, I do, like other members, recognise the need and the importance of tackling climate change. And so that's one of the reasons I question that uh, move by the government, because, of course, it will result in passengers on polluting short-haul flights from hubs such as London or Amsterdam, Dublin, other places that the long-haul flights go to instead of coming direct to Scotland. And not having these direct international links will, of course, dampen growth prospects for Scotland and cut us out of those sorts of opportunities. And also, of course, if we are going to seize the opportunity for the many sectors in the coming years that we wish to and boost our exports, the it is disappointing that we have this debate within 24 hours of the SNP government announcing yet again plans to drag us back into the issue of another divisive referendum, in their case a, an independence referendum. And I mean this, this simply creates a further uh, difficulty with an air of uncertainty for businesses at this time when in fact we need to embrace the opportunities that are opening up to the country. So I think the, the question that needs to be answered by the Minister is, is the government going to focus on these opportunities for Scotland and see how we can move things forward, or is the government going to focus on this um, indie ref obsession, as some would call it? Thank you. Right, we have to tighten up in timings, please. No more than four minutes. John McAlpine, followed by Willie Coffey. I welcome the publication of A Trading Nation. Not only is it a well-researched and evidence-based document, not only is it an extremely ambitious plan, but it's backed up by an additional £20 million of investment over three years. And that sum is significant. Uh, but the prize is worth so much more. A leap in exports from 20% to 25% of Scotland's GDP over 10 years would mean uh, an added 3.5 uh, £5 billion to our national wealth and 17,500 new jobs. It's attracted compliments from third parties. The Fraser of Allender Institute said what's refreshing about this act, act, action plan is the level of analysis that's clearly gone into informing the decisions that Mr McKee has taken. I understand that more than 20 data sets were interrogated to build an understanding of the current and future export growth opportunities an analysis was conducted of current and future, future global import demand in 100 countries across 66 industrial and 19 service sectors. As a result of all that work, we have a clear path to progress. I welcome the decision based on that evidence to play to Scotland's strengths by focusing efforts on activity that will create the greatest impact on the economy. We already know that Scotland's best performing sectors account, from eight, account for 84% of our export value. So it makes sense that a trading nation focuses on support for these super sectors. And they do make an impressive list. Food and drink, engineering and advanced manufacturing, life and chemical sciences, technology, digital and media, financial and business services, and of course, energy. Representing the rural south of Scotland, I'm pleased to see that food and drink is at the top of the list, though not surprised given its success and huge potential. In Dumfries and Galloway alone, it employs 9,000 people, uh, a very significant figure in relation to the re region's overall population. A trading nation certainly does a good job of highlighting uh, the strengths of food and drink, which accounts for 20% of Scotland's international exports, or £6 billion, um, in value. 
Uh, between 2013 and 2018, Scotland's food and drink exports increased internationally from 5.4 billion to 6.3 billion. After food and drink comes engineering, advance, engineering and advanced manufacturing, another Scottish success story. In 2017, it made up 17.5% of Scotland's international exports and was worth 5.7 billion. Engineering and advanced manufacturing covers things like metal manufacturing, machine and equipment, transport equipment, architect, architectural activities and engineering services, for example, design consultancy. We tend to think of these as the export of goods and often uh, that's what advanced manufacturing is, which explains why the customs union is so important given that sophisticated machines can contain parts from all over the world and rules of origin in the customs union present huge logistical challenges should we be outside it. And we shouldn't forget that even countries like Norway, which have agreements uh, through EFTA and the EEA with the EU, uh, don't cover services. In fact, no free trade agreement in the world covers uh, services and uh, the EU single market is by far the most important um, uh, single market in the world uh, for the free movement of services. I welcome the focus that Trading Nation brings to the sectors we intend to focus on in order to achieve export growth, but I also welcome the parallel focus on where we should be exporting to. The Scottish Government has profiled the 26 countries, which account for over 80% of the current exports, and identified these countries' share of the export, export value gap. This gap is calculated by comparing Scotland's current exports with those of similar competitors. The top 15 countries are priority one markets where the government expects the bulk of future growth to come from. That is the USA, China, Germany, France, Italy, Canada, Spain, the Netherlands, close, Switzerland, Sweden, Poland and Belgium. So in conclusion, this is an ambitious plan, but is backed by sound evidence and research. I congratulate the minister and all those who worked on a trading nation at a time when Brexit risks shutting Scotland and the UK off from trading partners. It's an important statement that Scotland is open for global business. Thank you. Can I re-emphasise that we're short of time in this debate and I will have to cut people's times if others don't stick to it. Willie Coffey. Sir, and I'll try and go as fast as I can. In the short time we have for the debate, I'd like to highlight three areas that are of particular interest as we take the trading nation strategy forward. Those are the digital technologies and services, opportunities for Ayrshire to grow its share of a number of markets, and the experience of the Irish in particular as an independent trading nation. The trading nation plan itself must be one of the most comprehensive documents I've seen in my 12 years in Parliament. It's over 200 pages of detailed analysis, showing not only Scotland's strengths, but also where we can make significant improvements. It has a useful country-by-country -country analysis to help us target where we might best look to increase our exports, and the sectorial analysis also lets us see where the greatest opportunities lie to grow particular parts of the economy. One of those target areas is technology, digital and media services. Scotland already has a thriving technology sector with over 11,000 technology enterprises operating here, with about 8,000 of them directly related to digital industries. In terms of exports, the whole sector accounts for around 3 billion of export value internationally and about the same again to the rest of the UK. So the technology sector is crucial for us. There are two key issues in my view that we need to make some progress on if we are to make further progress in this sector. The first is tackling the skills gap that we already know about. We need more people in software and web development, sales and marketing to complement the great work that's going on in cloud computing, developing apps for a number of digital services, and of course, our amazing gaming industry. According to Scotland IS, we need about 12,500 people each year, and we are producing about 5,000 from our universities, colleges, and apprenticeships. So more needs to be done to bring new talent into this sector, but to also reach out to invite people to retrain and join this fantastic industry. The second issue is how we continue to be part of the European Union's digital single market. If we're pulled out of it, as the inept UK Tory government states it, it tends to do, it would really damage Scotland's economy. It's worth about 400 billion euros per year to economic growth, boosting jobs and innovation. And it's probably worth about five billion pounds to the Scottish economy, but only if we are part of that market and not watching from the outside as the EU 
UK government seems determined to take us. Presiding officer, the Ayrshire picture is already a, sex, a success story in terms of many quality exports. Grants of Golston in my constituency specialises in high quality traditional Scottish recipes and exports 40 haggis products to 50 countries worldwide. It relies on its reputation for high quality and standards, as does our famous Dunlop cheese that was mentioned earlier by my colleague Emma Harper. The continuing Brexit uncertainty must not be allowed to undermine that reputation that Ayrshire and Scottish exporters have worked over years to preserve. And despite what some say, presiding officer, manufacturing in Ayrshire still accounts for a high proportion of jobs and GVA in the county. Lastly, my point on the Irish experience, presiding officer. If you took, take a look at the section in the Trading Nation Plan in Ireland and how it developed its international export performance, you can see that in the 70s it exported about 60% of its goods to the UK, similar to what one of the members said earlier was Scotland's current position. But now, by using all the powers and levers that it has at its disposal, Ireland's international exports now account for nearly 90% of its entire out output because of that incredible growth in those markets. The value of their UK market is still rising year, and year on year, but the international dimension to that growth has been a stunning success, and it's something that I know the Scottish Government is aspiring to replicate. Finally, in conclusion, presiding officer, I think the Trading Nation Plan offers Scotland and Ayrshire a new focus to increase and develop our key markets in the coming years. It allows us to learn from the successes of others, and it allows Scotland to develop our key industries in a uniquely challenging and competitive global market. Thank you. Jackie Bailey, followed by Gil Patterson. Presiding officer, when the Scottish Government's last export strategy was announced, it was John Swinney that was the Finance and Economy Secretary. Now, back in those halcyon days, the target was to increase exports by 50%. At the time, I said that was ambitious, but I was told that I was being too negative. The target was achievable. Now, there is nothing wrong with ambition, but if you want a target to be anything more than a fantasy, you need to know what you're doing and back that action with resources. It is disappointing to note that the Scottish Government failed to reach that 50% target by 2017 and instead achieved a 35% increase. The level of GDP, didn't rise and indeed the Fraser of Allender Institute observed that export performance has at best flatlined since devolution. Does the Minister understand why the government failed to reach the target? Because I'm keen that he does know that because if he knows why the government failed we can be confident that actually he needs, he understands what needs to be done in the future. Now I've heard a number of people talk about, well I'm happy to take an intervention if you want to stand up. Ivan McKee. Thank you. Thanks for taking the intervention. Yeah, on that point, if you read through the document, we're very clear on understanding what we need to focus on in terms of sectors, in terms of markets, in terms of type of businesses and what we need to do in market. And in answer to the question, why have we not uh, delivered over the, the last number of years? It's precisely because we haven't uh, grasped those, uh, those challenges and moved them forward as fast as we can. Bearing in mind the point that our exports have been growing faster than the rest of the UK over the last 10 years. Jackie Bailey. Presiding officer, I welcome the speech from the, the, the minister. But you know, I've heard so many excuses before that, that actually this is because of Brexit. Brexit is causing less exporting activity. Um, and you know, he and I don't like Brexit at all, and I agree with him on that. But the uncertainty of Brexit applies to the whole of the UK. Their export rate in the UK actually increased by more than Scotland, so we can do better. Of course I want Scotland to export more. The more we export, the more GDP that is generated, the stronger is our economy, and the return to the public purse in taxation is very welcome indeed. And let's be honest, Cabinet Secretary, um, the cabinet, no, no, because I've, I've had a mini speech from you in the middle of mine, so I'm not going to take any more interventions. Um, I think there is a huge untapped potential here, but I'm not convinced that the Scottish Government understands all that it needs to do to stimulate an increase in exporting. And I fear that, like its predecessor, we have a high-level strategy and a set of targets, but the outcome may well be disappointing. Of course, I welcome the expansion of trade envoys, the better use of the Global Scott Network, better working with the Department of International Trade. Equally, taking a more specific sectoral approach is good, 
but we need to recognise that exporting is concentrated in a small number of sectors and businesses. We trade to a small number of markets and Scotland's exports are much lower than comparable countries in the EU. The majority of Scotland's exports are actually to the rest of the UK. This is not a surprise as countries across the world tend to trade with their nearest neighbours more than they do with anyone else. 60% of our exports are to the rest of the UK, 40% to the rest of the world. So you might wonder what specific measures the Scottish Government is taking to boost trade to the rest of the UK. Well, let me give the Chamber a flavour of what's to come. It really all starts and ends with the SNP's obsession with independence. Pursuing an economically illiterate policy of independence will create huge uncertainty for business and the economy. Breaking up the UK single market and putting up barriers to trade will create huge obstacles for exports. And let's not forget the plans to change the currency. And I have to say to the Minister, the SNP conference said immediately, not some time later. And we have the funny spectacle of Derek Mackay and now the Minister himself falling over themselves to say how much they still want to use the pound, effectively ceding control back to the Bank of England and the UK government. So they want independence, but not really presiding officer because they'll have no control over their current currency. Let me say to the minister as gently as I can in concluding, I agree with him about the uncertainty that Brexit causes to businesses in Scotland. But the argument he uses and his party uses about Brexit are the very arguments that emphasize the uncertainty for businesses with independence. The message from business is simple. Keep the focus on exports, not the constitution. That's what this economy and this country needs. Absolutely no more than four minutes, please. Gil Patterson, followed by Tom Leeson. Hey, presiding officer, can I refer the public to my register of interest? Presiding officer, in my view, the document Scotland, a trading nation, is a substantial piece of work which is in a comprehensive, comprehensive format that is easily understood and points the way forward for Scotland to improve its economic future through increased exports. The document contains everything from comparing the export portfolios of a similar sized countries and recent improvements to their export performance to an, an in-depth analysis of Scotland's exports, uh, current uh, market shares and trading partner details. This comprehensive and well-informed approach will undoubtedly lead to better decisions by both government and the wider business community in Scotland and can only result in a more expansive and inclusive attitude to increasing our export base and our economic growth. Compare this positive Scottish business approach to the disaster of Brexit and what that is already doing to business confidence throughout the UK. And this is before any final resolution to Brexit outcomes, which with a potential no deal exists, uh, exit with, will certainly get worse. What is particularly encouraging uh, is the proposed increase by the Scottish Government to facilitate and encourage new and smaller businesses to become involved in export markets. When you realise that of the businesses in Scotland, uh, 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 340,000 businesses in Scotland, uh, only 11,000 of these export. And of that number, 500 amount to uh, uh, account for 80% of Scotland's export. You further realise that the huge potential uh, is yet untapped. However, it should be noted a considerable number of Scottish businesses, uh, like mine, are involved in the supply chain, both for manufacturing and exporting. Products from my business find its way to almost every single country in the world at the moment, and we ain't a giant business, I can assure you. It is encouraging that with the right plan and economic policy, Scotland can emulate similar-sized countries uh, export performance. Currently, ex Scotland exports 20% of its GDP, while in Norway it is 35%, in Finland it's 39%, and Denmark it's 55%. Of course, these are all independent countries. So, as a first step target of 25% of Scottish GDP by 2029 should be achievable with the initiatives contained in the Trading Nation Plan 
and success is a su successive commitment from a uh, future Scottish government should see that happen. The enormity of this potential in improvement from 20% of GBT GDP to 25% of GDP by 2029 will secure an additional 3.5 billion to GDP annually and will generate 17,500 jobs in the Scottish uh, business community. Also to Scotland's advantage is the diversity of our ex export rate, uh, range and our bus business expertise from engineering and advanced manufacturing, food and drink, technology, digital and media, energy, financial and business services, chemical sciences, life sciences, which is enormous and lots more. And this is all before we consider the knock-on economic effects of tourism, tourism and education, both of them on the ascendancy. What is pleasing is the expansion of the Global Scots network from 600 to 2,000 worldwide, with 500 within Europe by 2020, promoting Scotland, Scotland the brand, a brand already with some traction throughout the world. Like other similar countries who in the past centuries exported their people all over the world, the, the proposal to energise business, please. A business a, with the Scottish diaspora is a real exciting initiative. Uh, let me finish by welcoming this uh, presiding officer and I certainly will be support, uh, supporting the motion. Thank you. Tom Mason followed by Colin Beattie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome today's debate on the complex set of issues, and at the same time, I welcome the Scottish Government's recent paper. It is not perfect, but it, it is a start. Now, of course, striking future trade deals is a reserve matter, so it is important to frame our discussions on trade through existing structures. The, the report is right to focus on expanding the exports among businesses that would make the greatest impact on our economy and a more holistic approach involving government, enterprise agencies and the wider business community is certainly worthwhile. Presiding officer, we face a situation where our exports have diverged from those of the rest of the UK over the last two decades, having been roughly equivalent in 1998 and are now more than 10% apart as a share of GDP at 20.1% compared with 30.2% across the UK. We also have a problem that that simply not enough businesses are exporting, despite having the capacity to do so. The 8% of businesses that have the right profile for exporting, but are yet to try, must be given the chance to do so. This highlights an important role for export skills training and key element that was not considered in depth in the paper. I think that our business culture has become risk adverse compared with previous generations, and helping them to export more would go a long way to correcting that. Training in languages is somewhat something I think could be improved, particularly German, given that this is one of the main target markets identified in the report. Now, given that this government's own target to increase exports by 50% since 2010 has been missed by some margin at a cost of 3.7 billion to the economy, there is considerable ground to make up. So it is important that we all engage with this issue and try to provide some solutions. For our part, the Scottish Conservatives have set out a variety of proposals that seek to improve how we go about exporting through our independent report, The New Scottish Model. Chief among the main proposals is the creation of a Scottish Exporting Institute to gather experts in, the, in this field and use that experience to help with export training and certification. This is a serious suggestion and I ask ministers to consider it in the strongest possible terms. It could be of use not just across the country, but across different sectors as well. In my own region in the Northeast, one of the most important sectors is, is of course energy. As we emerge from a downturn in the oil price and explore new sources of energy, it is important to try to help these organizations expand their reach in all manner of business activities. Scotland has a surplus of natural resources, so we should work to make the most of any opportunity to use them. I understand the Minister will be speaking at the Energy Exports Conference in Aberdeen next month, and I believe this is, this is the kind of event that exactly is that sort of thing we should be attending. Providing officer, this paper and our discussion today are steps in the right direction. We need to improve our exporting performance so we can consider, less, consider ideas on their merits, no matter where they come from, 
So I hope that we will be able to scrutinize concrete proposals in due course and, where necessary, make the changes needed to advance the economic potential of our exports. Thank you. The last of the open debate speakers is Colin Beattie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. For centuries, Scotland has reached overseas for commerce and for culture. Contacts through the years were particularly strong with the Low Countries, France, the Hanseatic League, the German nations, and so many more. Sadly, most of these relationships came to an end following the Treaty of Union in 1707, and with the consequent narrowing of our horizons to focus on the rest of the UK and their empire. In more modern times, we've again taken our natural instinct to reach out to our neighbours and further afield, and establish new and revitalised trading links across the globe, but particularly again with Europe. In the face of a seemingly inevitable Brexit, which will seriously damage the strong links which have been established with Europe, I welcome the Scottish Government focusing on growing our exports and seeking to maintain and nurture our businesses as a trading nation. Boosting Scotland's export performance is important. It's important to Scotland's economy, encouraging jobs to be created and growing GDP, both of which would lead to increased resources so that public services can be improved and make Scotland an even more attractive place to live in and to trade with. It's been a decade since the beginning of the financial crash and the subsequent Great Recession. It's also been a decade since the introduction of the Scottish Government's National Performance Framework, which measures performance and progress towards the Scottish Government's economic priorities. The time is right to review and refresh. It's vital that Scotland remains a good place in which to do business, and I welcome the Scottish Government initiative to ensure that Scottish business, the Scottish business environment enables businesses to achieve their potential. It's an unfortunate reality that in Scotland, businesses are more often being acquired rather than scaled up. If the money was, re was reinvested back into the Scottish economy, that could be beneficial. However, it can also result in the loss of entrepreneurial role models and experienced people to manage larger scale businesses based in Scotland. Targeted employee ownership policies and incentives may help to keep business ownership in Scotland. Other policies could provide the anchoring effect that's needed to embed businesses in Scotland, including ensuring that there's adequate investment, not just from government, but from other sources. We need more large businesses based in Scotland to support those coming through the pipeline. I welcome the Scottish Government Economic Action Plan, which states that to improve the ability of Scotland's businesses to export, we will build on the recommendations of the Enterprise and Skills Strategic Board to set out a range of detailed actions in a trading nation. The 10-year plan for growing Scotland's exports to achieve 25% of GDP is ambitious, as should all Scottish Government plans be. I also welcome the £20 million in new investment over the next three years to achieve that. But more, to investing £2 million over three years to intensively support 50 high export growth businesses per year to ramp up overseas ambitions and activity. To create 100 new business-to-business -business peer mentorships per year for new exporters to expand the network of in-market sector specialists working in overseas markets to identify untapped potential and connect Scottish businesses to exploit this. To increase export finance support for Scottish companies looking to enter new markets. Last week, the cross-party group in Germany had Dr. Ulrich Hopp, Director General of the German-British Chamber of Commerce, and in Commerce of Industry and Commerce, as our guest speaker. He spoke about the, imp the importance of imports and exports between the UK and Germany and the specific importance of trade relationships within Scotland. During his presentation, Dr. Hopp quoted the national statistics that 10% of Scottish exports are sent to Germany, and this represents the third highest non-UK Union exports from Scotland. The only countries above Germany are the Netherlands with 15% and the USA with 12%. He was also clear that Scotland is highly valued in Germany and across Europe as a great place to do trade with. And despite the never-ending Brexit debacle, Scotland continues to be valued across these countries. And we should welcome and build on this. We Finally, presiding officer, the Scottish Government needs to do all it can to boost the Scottish economy and exports are very much key to that. And once again, I welcome the Scottish Government initiative.
We now move to the closing speeches. Patrick Harvey, four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Rhoda Grant very kindly said that she had sympathy with almost all of what was in the Green Amendment, and I, I reciprocate. That's the way I feel about the Labour Amendment as well, which raises some important uh, issues, such as the threat of takeover. That can increase the risk of tax avoidance, the loss of intellectual property. Uh, these are important concerns to raise. I, I have to say that those are challenges that can only be achieved through international cooperation, such as EU membership, and I hope that the Labour Party would agree with that. that their amendment does also endorse, however, the Scottish Government's targets themselves, with which I do continue to have a problem. As for the Tory amendment, uh, the, the, the Conservative uh, Party continues uh, in raising the issue of currency with their own particular kind of constitutional uh, obsession. Uh, Mr. Mr Lockhart reminded me of the, uh, the little dog with the coffee cup in the, in the meme. You know, uh, un uncertainty from independence is intolerable, but as the flames of Brexit uncertainty lick around him, uh, Mr Lockhart says, this is fine. It's also implicit from what Mr Lockhart is saying, it's implicit from his amendment that he thinks it's impossible to have easy trading arrangements and open borders between, for example, Sweden and Norway, or Ireland and Northern Ireland, uh, inside and outside, Ireland and Northern Ireland, if, there, if it's in a post-Brexit scenario, inside and outside the European Union with different currencies. Countries solve these problems around the world, including within the continent of Europe, uh, on a daily basis. And the status quo, the status quo proves that the, the problems Mr Lockhart is concerned with uh, are, are not real. The pro independent very briefly, I can take one. Dean Lockhart. Uh, an independent currency would require a new Scottish central bank with reserves of up to, say, £50 billion. How would Mr Harvey fund that? Would it be from public funding? Uh, when, when we have a full debate on independence, I will have plenty of time. I'm going to stick with the debate we're having today. The, 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 the pro-independence movement is explicitly internationalist. Brexit and increasingly the Tory party are clearly economic nationalists. They should abandon their Brexit obsession and engage positively with ideas about how to modernise and change the UK if they want to save it. Neither the, the Labour nor the Conservative amendments today, nor indeed the Scottish Government's strategy, engage with the existential threats humanity is facing. Threats which we have brought about by the way that we run the global economy. Those threats need government action in response, both domestically and multilaterally through international cooperation, not through free markets. In short, presiding officer, Whatever people see as the benefits from trade and increasing GDP, there will be no jobs on a dead planet. And that's what this debate needs to engage with. There is an alternative. I really want to emphasize that the green approach to this is not anti-trade. There is a fair, just, and sustainable approach to trade that is possible from high quality food and drink protected from the free market race to the bottom on standards to renewable energy instead of the lethal fossil fuel industry that's still too dominant in our economy, to the digital and creative industries and indeed education. But if we're going to achieve that fair, sustainable and just alternative, we must be focused not just on how much, but how and what and who and the impact on people's lives. And in short, presiding officer, we must commit in a way that I'm sorry the Scottish Government's strategy does not to the principles of trade justice, which this parliament has previously endorsed, but which I'm afraid today are missing from the Scottish Government's trade strategy. James Kelly, five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. I actually think it's been quite an interesting debate with uh, a number of good contributions across the chamber. I know we, there's not been consensus in some areas, but I think there have been some stimulating points made. Um, I mean, it's right that the government brings forward this document to uh, meet the export challenges. As Jackie Bailey pointed out, the targets have been missed. Uh, the 50% target that the government set based on 2010 figures has only reached 35%. So therefore, the government needs to look at how it addresses the shortcomings in its current export strategy. Uh, I think Maureen Watt made a really good point that a lot of it is based um, around a kind of small number of firms and clearly in order to extend that we need a wider range of firms exporting. 
Uh, I think we also need to be wary of the type of arrangements that we get into. I think Patrick Harvey made a, a lot of very relevant points around trade justice and also Rhoda Grant pointing out that a lot of jobs in the economy uh, are still uh, woefully underpaid. You know, we've got nearly half a million people not being paid the living wage. So the strategy needs to, to take account uh, of these issues. There was quite a bit of discussion um, from Dean Lockhart, from Emma Harper, and also from Willie Coffey around the digital issues. And I do think that that's quite important. You know, Dean Lockhart was right to point out the importance of embedding uh, digital in, in, in businesses that are looked to, to export. But what really interested me... Yeah, yes, Mr. Willie Coffey. Very much to James for taking the intervention. Could you clarify Labour's position in this, James? Is Labour in favour of staying in the digital single market, which is worth 400 billion euros, or coming out of it as the Tories propose? Uh, can I first of all say that you shouldn't have private conversations? Uh, always through me. And could you use people's full names, please? James Kelly. Sure, <laughs> Deputy President. No, sir, I, I mean, I think the points that Willie Coffey made about the digital s single market are, are, very, are very valid and should be taken on board um, by, by all parliaments and parties. Um, but the point I was going on to make was that Willie Coffey uh, addressed the issue of the skills gap and he quoted the fact that there were 12,500 uh, IT places required and that we were only producing enough to fill 5,000. I thought that figure was absolutely astonishing. And I'd actually done a bit of research around this issue ahead of the debate. And it was a real problem going all the way back to schools in terms of computing science. Uh, from 2007 to 2017, there's been a drop in the number of computing students uh, studying computing science at schools from 4,500, 4,960, 4,091, at a time when technology has continued to expand. And that also correlates with uh, a reduction in the number of teachers from 766 to 595. So the Scottish Government, I'm sure in his response, the Minister will be talking up what they're doing around digital, but they've got a big, big challenge going all the way through schools, colleges and university uh, straight into industry. Uh, number of contributions covered the dangers of Brexit. Willie Rennie, Joan, Joan McAlpine made very good points about the uh, customs union. Um, but, you know, I don't think you can make all those, as we frequently hear all those speeches warning about the dangers of Brexit, the collapse in trading arrangements, the impact that will have on the economy. We heard earlier on from the finance secretary that there's going to be a billion pounds black hole in the Scottish budget up to 2023 and he attributed a lot of that down to Brexit but you can't then uh, make all those statements and submit all that evidence and ignore the fact that if you then propose a second independence referendum when 60% of our trade and our exports is with the rest of the UK is almost to just turn a blind eye to the reality of that debate and I would also point out to the government at a time when we need to be dealing with the issues around expert, we need, exports, we need to be dealing with the wider issues in the economy and the crisis in public services. For the government to embark on the vanity project of producing a referendum bill and want to waste Parliament's time and waste public money on, on a diversion issue rather than on rather than on the real issues you that affect must close, people please. in local communities, that affect businesses. Let's deal with the issues that were sent to this parliament you must close, to address. Please. Jamie Halker Johnson, six minutes. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Trade is a vital component of any globalised economy. Our future economic success will depend in some considerable measure on our ability to export, but also to import and attract foreign direct investment here to Scotland. As a proportion of our GDP, Scotland has unfortunately lagged behind in volume of trade. While there has been some growth in recent years, it hasn't been, uh, been a uniformly positive picture. Our export figures actually fell backwards in 2014 and 2016. And when looked at in real terms, even our positive export growth begins to look a little anemic. 
So it is important as we go forward that growth not only con uh, continues consistently, but accelerates. And we have many success stories. Many Scottish exports are well known in every corner of the world. In my own region, the Highlands and Islands, we have some of the finest food and drink producers in the world. In Murray, Baxter's, Walker's, and enough distilleries to keep the world in drams, meat from Orkney, seafood from Shetland. And while trading goods is perhaps the most obvious form of exporting, in recent decades, we've seen a huge shift in the type of exports that we trade in, with growth in the services sector racing ahead of goods and manufacturing. A successful strategy must look towards emerging markets for both. Getting the basic, basics right is essential. So in our island communities like Orkney, Shetland and Western Isles in my region, there is a clear need for comprehensive future planning on freight. Overseas trade will seem a distant hope if islands landed fish or other produce is left waiting on quayside at local ports because of a lack of capacity to get it even to the Scottish mainland. Our road connections are in many places poor. After far too many years of campaigning, A9 duelling is taking pace, but at a slow pace, uh, and duelling of the A96 remains in, a, in its planning phase. Problems remain with our air links, both to other parts of the UK and to the wider world. Even from a passenger perspective, they are expensive and can be unreliable, whether that's because of weather, technical issues, or industrial uh, disputes. And in addition to this infrastructure, the foundations must be in place to operate in a global market for, market for services. Despite the future economy being powered by digital connectivity, the Highlands and Islands continues to be left behind on broadband rollout, with some of the worst services in Scotland. And unless exporting becomes a reality for all of Scotland's regions, we will be held back. And it's not for the want of promises or ambitious targets that we find ourselves in this position. The Scottish Government's economic strategy was published in 2011, with its headline target missed by a wide margin. A trading nation reasonably identifies a number of sectors where we can make gains, as well as priority target markets. And it would be useful to understand if, ministers, if the minister in summing up can understand where their current trade resources are being focused appropriately on these areas. Particular priority should be given to high value exports and producti productivity gains should be considered. Government working with businesses can and should make a real difference. One measure that we can, take closer, uh, it, we can take is close alignment on trade policy with the UK government and its unrivaled international networks and reach. I welcome some of the intergovernmental activity that has taken place, but it must bring results. In March this year, the Commons Scottish Affairs Select Committee published its report, Scotland, Trade and Brexit. It welcomed the moves towards a truly UK-wide trade policy, recognised the need for formalised trade discussions through the Joint Ministerial Committee, and outlined how future trade agreements could involve the devolved administrations. A Team UK approach with the devolved governments working with the UK government rather than <laughs> separately would be, a significantly positive, would be a significant positive for Scottish business. But as the committee said, this will require goodwill and trust from both sides. Complementing rather than duplicating must be the way forward in the international arena. These points are extremely important. But, but none of them should bind us to the fact that, as Jackie Bailey highlighted, Scotland's biggest trading partner, with which it trades more than the rest of the world put together, is other parts of the United Kingdom. This is unsurprising. The closeness of our internal domestic market makes the sale of goods and services straightforward. Our common legal structures and political institutions drive frictionless trade across these islands. And the end result is an arrangement that supports hundreds of thousands of jobs here in Scotland. While bodies like SDI focus their efforts internationally, there is, as Dean Lockhart highlighted, much more we can do to build up markets for Scottish goods and services in the rest of the UK. Instead, as we saw yesterday, the SNP's position on another independence referendum put these vital links at risk. We should also recognise that only a small minority of businesses export. The CBI identified this at around 8%. This has been acknowledged for some time. The Economy Committee's report on internationalisation of Scotland's businesses, for example, was released several years ago, yet little progress has been made to expand out that base. Given our increased reliance on small and medium-sized businesses, we should be active in promoting even our smallest firms where appropriate to export and to find and harness opportunities across the globe. Now, I don't have time to talk about all the uh, very positive contributions that were around the chamber today, but my colleague Dee Glockart did uh, start by noting some stark facts, among them that half of Scotland's exports come from a very small uh, number of businesses. 
uh, and that also with gr uh, major growth potential of economies outside of Europe. We need to be able to seize trading opportunities in more fast-growing markets. And he also outlined a number of sensible proposals aimed at boosting trade and building on the partnerships and links that we have as part of the UK to give Scotland a modern global reach. He also, as Willie Rennie and others have highlighted, how the SNP's recent push to break up the United Kingdom and, <laughs> and create uncertainty over currency will have a devastating impact on Scotland's position globally. And Gordon Lindus also, no Gordon uh, also you noted... Must close, please. Okay. I'm sorry, I thought I had seven minutes to speak. All right, okay. Presiding officer trade is an important component of our future economic development, and there is a real imperative to, to grow and to create an environment where our trade links with the world can flourish. We have to start by looking locally. What are the barriers that exist for uh, our businesses to expand? You must close, please. What are they prevented from reaching other markets? Both of Scotland's governments must work together, and they both must mm. deliver for Scotland's businesses. I now call Ivan McKee. Eight minutes should take us to decision time. Please, Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And, um, yeah, it's been an interesting debate. Um, a few positive contributions and some, frankly, from uh, people that clearly haven't uh, read the report or understood what it, uh, what it says. Um, touch on a couple before I go into more detail on the opposition amendments. Willie Coffey raised an issue of digital services and skills, hugely important, recognised uh, in, uh, in the report and also pushing Ayrshire as, uh, as well he should. Uh, Emma Harper invited me to go and visit local businesses, delighted to take up that offer. As with any other members that have got a similar offer, businesses they want me to meet and engage with. And uh, Tom Mason, very constructive input uh, around about um, energy and uh, the importance of that sector and also some ideas we can, uh, we can perhaps engage on. Um, and turning to the opposition amendments and first of all uh, looking at uh, the Green Amendment and to be fair much, uh, much to agree with in there. Um, I think the problem we've got with it is it deletes everything and kind of says that the work that's been done here is, uh, is, is not worth anything which I think is, uh, is absolutely clearly not the case because it does give a very substantial foundation for our, uh, our, our actions going, uh, going forward. Um, in terms of the point about beyond GDP, the member is or should be aware that the Scottish Government is very much engaged in the wellbeing economy discussions with other, uh, other, uh, other, excuse uh, other me, Minister. countries, including... Excuse me, there's an awful lot of them, um, which I'm sure are very interesting conversations going on, but could you hold them until after decision time, please? Yeah, uh, other economies include Iceland, New Zealand, Slovenia, um, Korea uh, uh, and others and that is an area we're engaged in looking at and understanding what, uh, what other measures there are beyond, beyond GDP. So it's something that is on the radar but the problem when I asked, uh, asked the member to, uh, to propose an alternative measure uh, re re revealed that there aren't any. Um, one offer I will make is that he'll understand if he's read the report there's a section in there around about evaluation frameworks and that is something that we are uh, taking on board uh, to do some significant work on and I'm quite happy to engage with the member if he can come forward with some hard measures that we can add in to include uh, include round about uh, uh, in addition to the measures that we've already already proposed and one thing I say I'm a bit disappointed on that he didn't engage in the debate around sectors uh, where Scotland has significant advantage around about low carbon and renewables uh, to develop those technologies and export them internationally a key part of our uh, export strategy going forward and just touching on the, the fair trade uh, principles and fair trade nation he's right that this uh, the parliament voted for those principles and this party did so so a programme for government uh, covers that, that issue and Scotland is a fair trade nation, something we are, we are all proud of. Turning to the, uh, the Labour a a amendment, um, mainly focused on uh, FDI um, and uh, I, I should let the Labour member know that there's, a, Rhoda Grant know that there's a, a piece of work on FDI coming along uh, in the next few months which will go into a lot more detail about our strategy on that. Um, but fair to say it's very, very important to recognise that FDI just isn't about investment, it's about bringing talent, bringing people, bringing technology, bringing access to markets internationally. And I know of several examples of businesses in Scotland that have been bought internationally which has allowed them to thrive and prosper, including some in my own constituency. So that's very much um, a mixed picture. And Willie Rennie's point about the anchor is hugely important. We do need to have those businesses uh, anchored, those sectors anchored, and our strategy is increasingly focused on building on the expertise we have in our uh, academic institutions, the skills and technology we enjoy, and the natural resources we enjoy in Scotland to ensure that we've got sectors that have stickability within our economy. The Labour Amendment calls for us to talk to businesses. I can let uh, Rhoda Grant know I've spoken to more than 100 businesses in the last 11 months about export within Scotland and continue to do so and we've engaged with uh, more than 50 sector and the uh, other uh, organisations in terms of putting together the, uh, the export plan so we haven't been uh, slacking on that front. I want to cover across uh, a few of the points that um, 
Dean Lockhart raised. And I must say, I'm a bit disappointed. Dean Lockhart should uh, have a better understanding of, of what this is all about and should have read through the analysis that's in the paper. Um, he talked about the priority countries and the reflex uh, reaction to Europe bad emerging good without understanding or acknowledging the huge amount of work that's gone into the evidence base to analyse the 15 uh, drivers of where economic growth in terms of Scotland's exports will come from. Uh, I would recommend that he reads the methodology paper and if there's any comments on that, the, 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 the way that those 15 indicators are balanced or anything about the maths it's in there, please come back and talk to us. But otherwise, please stop just throwing up um, sound bites about emerging good Europe bad, please. Dean Lockhart. Thanks very much. The Minister talks about the new export strategy as if he's part of a new incoming administration. The reality is his government has been in power for 12 years and has missed every one of its own economic targets, including on exports. Can the Minister explain what has gone wrong over the past 12 years? Minister. Well, I'll refer back to the point I made earlier. Yes, we understand we've got challenges. We understand that we didn't hit the 50% target. But we also should recognise, and I've told them this three times already this afternoon, that Scotland's exports over the last 10 years have grown at 4.7%, which is higher than the UK average over that time of 4.3%. So yes, we've got work to do, but we're doing better than any other part of the, of the UK. Um, and uh, Emma uh, Harper's already um, put them right on the point about digital, which is covered thoroughly in section 6.4 of the plan. And when he talks about it's not having any actions. There are more than 100 individual actions in this export plan that I will be tracking forward in the weeks and months ahead to make sure we hit those targets. So please don't accuse us of, uh, of not having a clear action plan on this. It's very, very clear and, uh, and very thorough in terms of what it covers. I want to just um, quickly touch on a few business quotes. CBI, um, a data-driven approach to identifying product sectors and markets is hugely welcome and then endorse the efforts to simplify the export and landscape. Um, uh, Fraser of Allender Institute, an excellent piece of evidence-based policy making. Scotland IS very much welcome this ambitious plan to grow Scotland's exports. In Chambers of Commerce, we welcome the Scottish Government's export growth plan. It's a key enabler in boosting Scotland's export potential and enhancing Scotland's profile on the international stage. All of those organisations recognise the work that's gone into this plan and the, what, uh, the importance it has in driving forward Scotland's export performance. Um, I don't have time to touch on all our wonderful sectors. Several have been mentioned already. Food and drink with a world-beating whisky sector uh, and a food sector that's going from strength to strength. Key strengths in the, in the energy sector, particularly in the transition to low carbon in our renewable sector, where we're genuinely world-class. Uh, life science and drug discovery and precision medicine and others, where again, genuinely world-class. FinTech, digital uh, tech, media, already been mentioned. A fabulous space sector, um, looking forward to taking a big slice of that world market going forward. Another area such as quantum and nanotechnology, where again Scotland is genuinely world class with huge export opportunities in those markets going forward. And just to finish up and conclude, the uh, presiding officer, um, through the course of my job, I've got the pleasure to visit on Scotland's behalf international markets. I've done 11 such trips over the last 11 months, and in every one of those I go to, Scotland is held in high regard for our skills, our technology, and our products in countries recognise that and want to trade with us. But when I look at more, almost all of those countries in Europe, they're doing better than us. Countries of similar size to us, countries with less resources than us, countries with not as well developed uh, academic institutions as we have. Um, and the reason why, as Willie Coffey very much pointed out earlier on when he talked about the Irish experience, it's about our ambition. It's about Scotland being ambitious enough to stand on our own two feet, take full control of our economy, because the difference between us and those countries that are doing so much better than us is one thing and one thing only is that their independence, their normal independent countries have full control over their economies and economic levers, and that is where Scotland is going, and that is what will drive our economy forward in the long term. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and that concludes this afternoon's debate on a trading nation. And before we turn to decision time, I just wanted to address the... Uh, Point of order that was raised by Murdo Fraser earlier about the publication of forecasting information. The provision of information such as this is a matter that is dealt with, that is not dealt with, I should say, in standing orders, therefore it's not a matter for the presiding officer. The timings for the provision of this information is set out in a protocol between the Scottish Government and the Scottish Fiscal Commission. Uh, the protocol sets out that the Commission will report, uh, sorry, the Commission report will be published on the Commission's website after the Cabinet Secretary has delivered his statement and laid before Parliament on the day of publication. Mr Fraser may wish to raise his concerns uh, with the Government on this point, but I recognise that if he wishes to do so, there will be an opportunity at forthcoming meetings of the Finance and Constitution Committee. And I would thank Mr Fraser for raising that point of order.
So we turn now to decision time. There are four questions today. The first question is that Amendment 17436.2 in the name of Dean Lockhart, which seeks to amend Motion 17436 in the name of Ivan McKee on a trading nation, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 17436.2 in the name of Dean Lockhart is yes, 51, no, 65. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 17436.1 in the name of Rhoda Grant, who seeks to amend the motion in the name of Ivan McKee, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members, we cast the votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 17436.1 in the name of Rhoda Grant is yes, 51, no, 59. There were six abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 17436.3 in the name of Patrick Harvey, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Ivan McKee, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 17436.3 in the name of Patrick Harvey is yes, 10, no, 87. There were 18 abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And the final question is that motion 17436 in the name of Ivan McKee on a trading nation be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 17436 in the name of Ivan McKee is yes, 110, no, 6. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. And that concludes decision time. I close this meeting. Thank you.